All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode six of Experience AV. We are Jim and Jeremy, and it's it's been it's been a challenging start, I think. Right? Yeah, I mean that that was a nice way to put it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just why why would you say it was a challenge, Jim? Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with challenge, right? But it's it's. It's just a challenge. Well, let's let's talk about it. I mean, yeah. I know I'll feel better if we talk about it. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think so. All right. Well, we got a new computer, which is awesome. It's a beautiful computer, although it's a Mac, not a Windows machine. You know, we're like, hey. We want the best of the best when it comes to streaming and recording and when it comes to media we're gonna get we're gonna get a mac and then and then i tried to use it and i kept trying to press the command key like it was going to open up a start menu so we use vmix vmix <laughs> is a windows program not a mac program a windows program i knew this going in but i'm like you know We'll go back to OBS. OBS is freeware. I know how to use it. We started with OBS. We thought we were going to do the whole show in OBS. Then we had a bunch of NDI issues because we're running teams with NDI and we hadn't figured out that we needed to have a totally separate computer. So originally it was my laptop running OBS, running teams and having all kinds of audio issues then we get another laptop that's what we've been running on we're tanking the processor on that <laughs> laptop tanking the memory and we're like okay yeah no i need a new computer we're gonna get a new computer and i knew that vmix didn't run on mac and i thought we'd go back to obs I spent a couple hours on it before we had our show and uh, you know, we, we always give ourselves a little bit of a buffer leading up to the show and uh, it wasn't enough. <laughs> In fact, it was such a failure. We're back using the underpowered computer <laughs> for the show tonight. So, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little, a little overtaxed from the technical failure for the 60 minutes leading up to the show. But you know what? We're here. We're here. Hopefully people can hear us and well, see us. I think and, they can. And this, this is the problem of doing any type of presentation, show, whatever, and, and being in the AV industry because the pressure is so high. You know, it, it's one thing if you're like a YouTube star or a TikToker or whatever, you just turn on your phone and, and go and everything's fine. And if the audio stinks or the video doesn't line up, it's not a big deal. You know, pe people kind of expect it. But when you have AV killers like like we have in, in, in our audience sometimes who are just trained in this art, they're going to pick up on it. <laughs> Yeah, we and just got a comment, dude, right from Casey Baldwin. He's like, yeah, we can see you and there's minimal robot. I mean, I mean, intelligibilities. Yeah, appreciate that. <laughs> low robot today. We're low robot. <laughs> low robot. Not high lo robot. Low robot. <sighs> low so robot. My, my CPU says it's only at 11%. That's what's crazy. <laughs> Total of 52. Oh, 67, 54, 71. Yeah. See, this, this PC just yeah. comes to its knees when we are hosting but back to what you were saying live <laughs> live av and it does not doesn't even have to be a show right it could just be a meeting everything in yes. av is live yes any convention center any anything anything it, it's just it, it's it's hard it's hard in av okay well you know i'm gonna take a breath yeah but the good thing is Compared to our first couple of shows, I mean, when Jeremy was struggling, Jeremy is the the the, the tech behemoth behind this show. Our first few shows was even more of a struggle, but when we got to a certain point and we decided to cut and just go back to where we were, get back to a known good solution, I mean, you had it up and three minutes or, or, or something ridiculous like that. So that was super impressive. You got to feel good about that. 
I mean, it was one show that we actually accomplished that for. And I feel like you, you totally kind of threw me under the bus right there. Like, yeah, all these technical failures, folks, <laughs> they're mine, not Jim's. Okay, let's be. No, no. it, it was a group <laughs> effort. I was giving you props. That's what I thought. All right. All right. So now I'm just yeah. sensitive. I'm sensitive. I understand. I understand. Okay. I'm sensitive after the uh, the lack of being able to get the new PC up and running. You see, I even called it a PC. Yeah. How As do you, you feel about that, Mac lovers? As you sh- I, I don't do Mac. I can't. It, it just doesn't jab at my brain. I don't know, man. Well, it has an Intel chip in it. It's basically a PC, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, oh. breathe. We're here. Oh, we're here. We're here. We are here. To be here. Yes. Jim, what's going on in your personal life, man? You got any you got any fun personal updates, things you want to talk about before we dig into the the meat of it? Yeah, you know, so this weekend I was the proud coordinator of a jamboree on the air for Matinicock District Scouts BSA, and it reignited my passion for amateur radio like if we're, if we're if we're going geeky in this show i don't think there's much more geeky than amateur radio but it was awesome like the the, the whole idea is to introduce scouts to that hobby but even better than that it's like there's so much digital stuff going on in amateur radio right now um and there's so much troubleshooting that it, it was it, it just kind of reinvigorated my passion for the hobby which was pretty cool and uh we had like i think six operators out there they set up portable antennas and just from their car um with a a a battery portable radio like a, a antenna which actually has a lot of technology in the antennas nowadays but we were talking to North Dakota, we were talking to France, we were talking to Finland, we were talking to um, Gilwell, which for any any scouters out there know that Gilwell has a very near and dear place in, in scout leadership's heart. Um, that That's where Lord Baden-Powell had his first leadership conference for scouts and just the fact that we were able to hit it from Long Island to Gilwell Island in the UK with, with just a stupid little radio, I mean a really smart radio, but a, 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 just a portable radio and an antenna, no cell connection, no internet connection, and to show the scouts that it was, it was really cool. It was really cool. So that, that and I don't know, I, I, I feel like all of these hobbies that I was so passionate about in high school, uh, you, you go to college and things, like you, you kind of leave them on the side, you know? And like when I was growing up, I was all into amateur radio. Um, when there was uh, emergencies or disasters on Long Island, amateur radio would be like kind of the, the communications between them because fire couldn't talk to police, couldn't talk to the army, couldn't talk to the Marines. And so each one of those organizations had an amateur radio operator to let them communicate. So when I was 13 years old, I would hop in with two Marines in a Humvee. We'd go to a place that got flooded out and we'd have to go check on it. It, it was so cool. And then you go to college and you're you're busy with other things, you know. And so now I feel like I'm I'm super back in scouts. I'm all gun ho. And and now this last weekend, uh, I, I I really got back into amateur radio, and it's it's a it's a good time. I, it was it was it was really cool. The scouts had fun. I feel like the scouts nowadays with the internet and with cell phones aren't as impressed that we were able to talk to all these faraway lands with just a a radio like a thousand dollar radio and a three hundred dollar antenna because they can do it with their stupid cell phone but once you get to know kind of what what's involved in that it it's it's very impressive and so the the of course we had all these like thousands of dollars in radios, thousands of dollars in antennas. And what did the scouts like? They just like making the Morse code key go beep. <laughs> that was the star <laughs> of the show. $10 Morse code key going beep and, and going back and forth with, with Morse code. But it was it was a great weekend. It was, it was really a lot of fun. Man, that sounds awesome. So yeah. an important question that I know everybody's going to want to know. Was dad there? 
Dad was there. And to oh. an NW and WF2T were working the radio waves, baby. You know it. I love he was great. It. He was in his element. Yeah. I it, love it was that. Awesome. Yeah. We should maybe maybe consider doing our audio for the show over ham radio because maybe it'll sound better and have <laughs> less <laughs> robotics. <laughs> uh, that sounds awesome, man. How many scouts did you have there? Well, so it was our first one we ever did. I was hoping to have like a sea of scouts, maybe like 40, 50. We ended up with 23, which... I'm 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 calling it a success. You know, the the um it was manageable. It was our first time doing an event like this. And so we really didn't know what our contacts were gonna be like, how the weather was gonna be, what was gonna happen. So it was a nice steady flow. We got some incredible pictures and the scouts that were there I think really had a, a, a good time. So it was uh it, 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 it was a success. It wasn't a huge, like overwhelming success, but for our first go at it, it was a it was a big success. Congratulations, man! That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it was good. It was good. At first, you were like, "We talked to North Dakota," and I was like, "North Dakota, huh? That's not yeah. all that." Im-. And then you're like, "France, so, okay? Maybe we should lead with France." <laughs> well, I wanted to build. They got to build up to it, yeah. man. That's nice. Yeah. So I, yeah. I've heard, and I I have. I know Casey, he's on the, he, he's listening in, or he was listening in. I think we just lost him. We're, oh. we're down to, we're down to zero viewers. That's okay. That's, that's okay. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, I heard that with a powerful enough radio, you can talk to the space station. Is that true? Actually with a, a cheap rinky dink, I don't have a woman, but like a, like a walkie talkie. It looks like a walkie talkie. You can listen to the space station. Which is crazy. You you need you need a, a good antenna, but that and and that's that's what this whole thing was for. This was the first event. Like um, our district got selected to actually talk to the astronauts on the space station in June. So, oh wait, really? Yeah, it is going to be awesome. And and so it's part of the amateur radio on the International Space Station program. Um, each year they select a few different schools or organizations to actually spend 10 minutes talking to the astronauts. The reason it's 10 minutes is because space station is flying over at like 17,000 miles an hour. It's 200 miles up in the air. And so you only have a 10 minute window to talk to them. Plus, you know, astronauts are a little bit busy while they're <laughs> up, up, up in the space station. Um, and so we, we've been selected, which is awesome. So in June, we're going to get 10 minutes to talk to them. But the point of the program is to push STEM and amateur radio and space exploration. And so this Jamboree on the Air was like our first kickoff event and introduction to amateur radio. So it was good. It was good. And then in June, yeah, like, oh, well, actually, I mean, throughout the year, we're going to be promoting events. But like um, my father Mario on his little HT, his, his handy talkie, uh, the space station will transmit pictures over amateur radio that you can pick up with a, a handy a HT and you can download the pictures from the space station over the radio, which is, it's awesome. I didn't even but, know that you could transmit pictures over. And Seriously? This is why it's so cool. Yeah. And, and, and like, you know, it, it's a completely different discipline, right? But the, like the fundamentals are there. You're you're troubleshooting, you're digitizing, you're sending it over some type of medium, and it's 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 AV. You know, it's just slower because it's radio waves, but you're not reliant on any public services. You can do it all from your car. You can do it all from your home, and and that's 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 what gets me. You get to just play with all that stuff. That sounds amazing. Yeah. That sounds amazing. I've said yeah. this like to you several times before. I so wish you didn't live on the other side of the country or or maybe better put, I, I wish I didn't live on the other side of the country. Yeah. Or just just that we are so far apart because I would love to come be a part of that even though I did not make it past uh, Weeblos. I think I, I was done at Weeblos. Sucker. I know, you, dude. You, you quit just when it was getting good, man. I blame my 
I blame my parents, but you know, don't don't we all? <laughs> Man, that's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. My son Thanks Lucas is just at that as at that age where he's gonna cross over from Weeblos into Boy Scouts, and that's when like you become an adult. It's like freaking me out that he's there. It's, it's and wild. that's arrow of light time, right? Like arrow yeah. of light signifies the crossover to to proper Boy Scouts, right? Yeah. Or yeah, is it still Boy Scouts? Scouts BSA. So there is a Boy Scout troop, but there's also we can't say the G word Scout troop. So it's a Scouts BSA female troop or girl. We can say girl troop. We can't say. All right, GS. but can, can we can we just hit on some irony here? Yes. What does BSA stand for? Don't 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 get caught up in that, man. All right, it's just don't, an acronym. Don't, don't, listen, it's listen, just, it's the it's feeling. KFC. The feeling. It's yeah. no chicken and KFC. It's just KFC. <laughs> don't worry about it. All right, all right, all right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a little sensitive on that particular topic. Yes. Just, I love the gender equality of Scouts <laughs> BSA, even yes. though. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, I'm. I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. The whole thing. The whole thing. So are you going to pick up ham radio again? Like, is this, are we, are you back in? Are you I'm back like, in, baby. Got your call back sign, going to have one of oh, those yeah. antennas mounted in the back of your, in the back of your uh, house that makes you look like one of those, you know, prepper folk that, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that oh, talk yes. to the space station <laughs> with their own equipment. <laughs> yeah. It's I coming. say that with love because I totally want to be that guy as well. I've got, I've got it. I've got the book. It's right there. The ham radio license manual. Come I, on. I know. Oh. But I never did the work. I never oh. did the work. I bought the book and I never did the work because, well, because of work. I like to blame work on that. That's awesome. We'll get you. We'll we'll get you a license. That's good. We will we will get yeah. Yeah. I could I could see definitely geeking out and I would love to be able to to talk back and forth on that. Yeah. All right. Well, I've got a personal fun to share and it hits on two things. First one we already hit on live A V. So uh, everybody knows or or those that have might have listened to our, our previous cast last month, I've become involved with a local marching band my daughter's marching band i've been taking ownership over their electronics and their audio system and it's pretty old like 15 years old old yamaha rig couple of yamaha amplifiers behringer mixer and we've got a little uh, Apple Airport Extreme that gives us Wi-Fi, and I can get up in the stands where the judges are for the for the for the mixing and get it mixed nicely. For those of you who aren't marching band people, which I consider myself not a marching band person prior to this this school year, uh, <clears throat> we've got about seventy five ish in our band most of them out on the field, you know, carrying and marching with an instrument. And then the pit is made up of two marimbas, two vibraphones. We've got a uh, Glockenstein. Uh, yeah. The Glockenspiel. Big, yeah. Hell yeah. Glockenspiel. See, see, I even tried to yeah. bust it out, but you corrected me because Jim's a marching band guy. Oh. <laughs> oh. Glockenspiel, that's what it is, which is my new favorite instrument just because I like to say the word Glockenspiel. Ooh, one of the best words ever. And then we have a synth player and that's where we have the electronics, right? The electronics is we got we got all the keyboards mic'd up, we got the synth player, so we're adding all kinds of really interesting sounds. So to make the long story short, we, we perform at every football game for the high school and then we are also participating in state organized competitions okay and we went to our first competition up at nau in flagstaff that's northern arizona university they have this dome up there it's called the i'm totally totally spacing it right now that's hilarious sky dome i think is what it's called anyway full dome in indoor football stadium where they play a bunch of the high oh schools play up there yes what's that awesome it's awesome oh, 
Totally awesome. Yeah, I posted some pictures, I think, on, on the Facebook page. The inside of the dome is just this incredible architecture. It's huge. The audio is so unique in there because it's so reverberant because of the mm -hmm. dome. And so we're excited. First of all, we had to push gear all over campus. I mean, like literally, I thought several of the kids were going to die because <laughs> we asked so much of them in terms of pushing this equipment from from practice field over to the main stadium. But anyway, one of the things that we have going on is we got a battery backup in the rig. So we break it down. Everything's on wheels. We wheel everything over and when we're done with warm up, we like to leave everything on the battery so that the the air, the airport extreme and the mixer, they're they're already on because when you get out to the field, like you got to get everything yeah. set up and get going on the show. And this is where I usually go all the way up to where the judges are with the iPad so I can mix where the judges are. So I'm like, OK, great. You know, we, we have our warm up. We've pushed over to the main to the main. Um, field and battery dies completely oh. dies and i'm like okay we're cool oh. i think just the battery died i think just the battery died so i let everybody know we're waiting there you know we're waiting for our turn to go on the field hey the battery died because we've been sitting here for too long and it's this tiny little battery so it should be fine when when we go to plug it in so they roll it out on the field I climb the 574 million steps up to where <laughs> this is a serious stadium. This isn't your typical bleachers you find in a high school, right. you know, high school football field. I climb up there. I'm 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 ready. I'm in position. I'm ready. I'm super excited. And they can't get the system to come on. The oh. the battery backup will not turn back on. And they didn't. They didn't unplug it and just bypass it because it wasn't wired up for that. And we had to do the show without the electronics. So we had no synth. We had no extra uh, samples that we had built in. There's a whole bunch of really cool kind of spatial samples and vocal samples that we've incorporated into the show. None of that. None of that. So first competition again back to that whole point of pressure and live av and i was heartbroken because i feel like i have failed them i know it was a failed piece of gear but i've started to take ownership over this yeah. over this rig nice. for that for the band the the pit boss I, I like to call her there's there's a there's this really awesome girl danny she 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 runs the pit she's the staff for the pit so i call her danny the pit boss and uh, she's stressed out. She's nervous. She's like, oh, my God, like we have we have failed. So we do the show. We ended up scoring first in every single category for our division, which was, you know, cool and a bit awesome. of a recovery from the loss of the battery. But, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're rolling everything back up to the truck. And, and this was the second point of the story that I wanted to make. Because it was an incredible show of extreme ownership. So the, the band director, I kind of came up to him. I'm like, man, all right. Artery had looked up a new battery backup, sent him a link. Like, we need to buy this. Let's get some good stuff in here. Let's get a new one. Let's get get some get get some new gear. Make sure this doesn't happen again. And I said, but hey, we won first in every single in every single uh, category for our division, right? So that that should make everybody feels better. And he goes, yeah, no. No, it doesn't make me feel better. And I said, oh, man, really? Why? He goes, because I didn't set these kids up for success. I didn't replace that thing, you know, and, and he took 100 percent ownership over the fact that that battery had died. And, you know, equipment fails. That's part of the deal, right? Especially with live AV. But instead of blaming me or instead of blaming Danny or blaming anything else or even blaming the battery, he took that ownership and he was like, I did not set these kids up for the best possible success that they could have had. And I was super impressed from a leadership perspective. So impressed that I talked about it internally at level three at our company. And then I had the opportunity to, to actually share it with the band director last week and say, hey, I just need to tell you that I was so impressed with the way that you took ownership over this, that like, that's such an amazing example of extreme ownership, which if 
anybody hasn't read Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and, and Leif Babin, I, I could, couldn't recommend that book more, but it was an incredible example of that from a band director. And you know what? They have found the money. We've got the new gear. We had our, our next performance last night, scored first in every category, as well as took the whole show, got all the points, got the, got the event, and kind of turned it around. So um, that's the update for the marching band commitment in my life right now. And it was such a, it's been an incredible experience. And and back to the point you made early on, you just never know what you're going to get when you're trying to do this live stuff. You know, stuff fails, stuff happens, and you got to recover from that. And you got to put, you know, as they say, the show must go on, right? Mm -hmm. And and it went on and we're fixing the issues and I'm just excited to be a part of it. It's it's a really cool experience. That's awesome. And it, it's rare to find that level of leadership, you know, in, in, in a lot of high schools. So that, that I, I think uh, you and your daughter kind of lucked out there. That's uh, that's awesome. That's really good. Yeah, it, it has spawned quite an ongoing conversation with myself and the band director around leadership specifically and just tenants of leadership and you know this year we've got i think two, over two-thirds of the band is freshmen and the, <sighs> yeah That's yeah young. so e exactly right so we got a young band and a bunch of the staff is young as well a bunch of the staff are kids that just graduated within the last year or two so young staff young band and it's a good reminder because for years he had a little bit more of uh, upperclassmen within the band and some more uh, mature and older staff and now that he's got a young band and young staff it's kind of having to revisit all those leadership concepts again and making sure that we're working with them and developing them. And so I'm, I'm getting kind of excited that that there might be some other opportunities for me to jump in and help with with some of the leadership side of the band as well, because so much of it is just leadership concepts, you know, and extreme ownership. They're, they're actually reading the book Extreme Ownership in the band. They're doing they are doing a full like leadership team book club around extreme ownership. And I'm like, oh my God, we're doing the same thing at level three. That is so cool. And what great timing right now. Incredible. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. Well, that that's the personal, that's the personal stuff. Um, you want to kick us off into, into what, what the topic, topic is? is? We're about yeah. 20 minutes in and got about a half an hour to talk about some fun stuff yeah so this week we were going to be talking about what you do with all the system documentation well, well and, and really just system documentation in general but but more specifically there are certain reasons to store information on projects and on systems by project there are certain reasons to store it by system or by building and I, I I wanted to just spend a little bit of time discussing that and and discussing how you categorize how you save system documentation. Love it. Yeah. Love it. This is a this is a really um, hot topic within our own organization right now. But it sounds like you got a little bit more to to say there in terms of introducing. Yeah, yeah, and, and 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 I think you know, and I don't want to. I, I wanted to keep the conversation open, um, but in in my mind anyway, I I thought that there, you know, from accounting and project management, totally makes sense. I I don't know how you wouldn't store those files, project per you know per per project, but then once the project is is done. You know, I, I guess there are benefits of, of still keeping it in the project for, for archival reasons, but then at that point it becomes living with the system. And so in, in my mind anyway, it makes more sense to kind of split all that information up per system because that's now going to live with the client and the system. And so in, in my mind anyway, that th those are kind of the, the two ways of rolling with it, but there might be more. So I, I, I didn't want to 
kind of pigeonhole us into those two. I, I wanted to just explore it, but that's in that's where I was coming from this conversation. Okay, so I want to I want to clarify because I want to make sure I fully understand you know exactly what we're what we're hitting on here, and and I know that you know my brain is very much a project manager brain, mm -hmm. and and the first word is is kind of the indicator, right? You th you think in terms of projects as opposed to as opposed to rooms or systems. So you get an opportunity. It could be one room. It could be fifty rooms, right? that turns into a project, you assign a project manager, you're tracking all the information for that project as a project. You got a project folder, that project folder has 50 different rooms. The project completes, you get the, you get the project done. Now you archive all that information and, and typically, as I think you're indicating and, and has definitely been the case in our organization and I think many others, the archive structure follows the project structure, but right. then let's let's say you come back and rebuild two or three of those rooms five years down the road or eight years down the road. Different project, years down the road, different project number, different project name, same customer. So you might still have it in the same customer folder. That's an easy top level folder for the archive, but now you've got systems represented in the original project folder You've got updated systems represented in this new project folder and so on and so forth, right? That's just, that's kind of the simplified example, but it could go on and on and on and on like that where you have information about a room or a system or all the way down to a device, you know, depending on how granular you want to get. And if that device is a shared device amongst multiple different systems, multiple different rooms. And so, why does this matter? I mean, if it's if it's a project and you're just going and you're upgrading something later as a project manager, I can go get that past information, the new engineer or the same engineer, depending on what goes on, puts together a whole new set of drawings. You go forward with that project, you get it done, you archive it. Why does it matter at the end of the day? Well, and, and that makes sense from a from a project point of view, but I'm more concerned about service you know and and that might necessarily that that doesn't mean upgrading the system that's oh my god there's a client calling room 301 is broken and so i'm a remote support technician i've got to find the most accurate information about room 301 as quickly as possible but if it's cat if, it, if it's stored as project folders now I might have to dig through four or five different project folders to find the most accurate information on that room because there's no way to tell if that room was touched by this project, that project I got to dig through and all the while the, the clients on the phone breathing down my neck. I mean, that's the, I think you're hitting it, right? That's the whole point. It's who has to deal with the information mm -hmm. after the project is completed. Yeah. You know, and, and the project team lives with the system. I've said this many times in the past, right? Build build with service in mind. Mm -hmm. And I think where a lot of integrators or or us anyway have have maybe stopped at is on the fabrication and installation. Fabricate and build the system with service in mind, meaning make it easy for a service technician to be able to get access to the equipment or re-terminate a cable if something breaks or pull a piece of equipment from a rack. But I love what you're speaking to, which is it's, it's not just the equipment being serviceable, the system being serviceable. It's how quickly as a service person can I get access to the information and ultimately resolve this issue or kind of to your point. I've got customer A on the phone. How quickly can I get the information up related to the system that they're in? Because the sooner I can get that information in front of me, the sooner I have a, a good chance of actually being able to assist them, even if something's not broken. Just being able to get your head around what it is that that customer is looking and dealing with at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. So have you ever seen information stored on a per system per room basis after the project i have 
uh, in my previous life at, at AVR, we actually stored system information per system. So it was all systems listed out and we actually had project folders within the system folder which, which was which was wacky but like the, the the way the file structure was is it wasn't based on per project that in, in accounting it was per project for for billing purposes but once it shifted over into operations we had every system we touched in in the systems folder and we, you know we came up with um naming schemes that that tons of clients have uh and so at the root directory of that system folder we always had most current drawing for that for that system program site file and most recent pictures and then we had project stuff like you know bills of material if if we had to order something but it was it was always capture the, the, the you know in, in ISO 9000 talk the, those control documents live in the system folder root directory so that you always have access to it you always have access oh, and, and the operating manual so that if someone called up and say hi I'm from client ABC I'm on the third floor in this room I can't turn it on immediately uh, the, the the service technician could just find that system folder click it and have access to operating manual drawings site file control program uh, and pictures and be able to to get to work as quickly as possible that sounds incredible it was cool it was cool but we were a much much smaller organization than level three and so you know level three is doing like hundreds of rooms in in a project we we never did a project like that you know, and and so I'm so a big that, fan that of the system. Me, so that makes me want to ask a question. Like, if you if you did the project and you you maintained the the data, if you will, as a project while you were deploying, and then now it's done, and you want to you want to kind of put it in that long term archive that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. Was there a significant lift of time to get it all structured and organized? the way that you just described well we, we we had two sets of folders on the accounting side was always per project for for billing purposes but as soon as it was in operations like when drawings were first drawn it was always done by system so we we started out with that but our average project was 10 systems top per per project you know so it, it wasn't that big a lift if we were doing projects with hundreds of systems per project i don't know if that would have worked well okay but let, let, let's let's dig into that a little further because i'm i'm really curious so even on a system or a project that had 10 systems in it mm -hmm. did you have all 10 of those systems represented in a single drawing package no each system had its own drawing package what if those systems were interconnected through like a shared, you know, okay, so uh, the very large financial institution who shall yes. not be named, but who, <laughs> yeah. who, who we both have lots and lots of experience with, right? Incredibly complex in China. And I know that that AVR did a lot of work with, with, uh, with that organization, including some of the standards drawings. What would you do if there was a shared IDF or an NPR, for example, right? Here's an NPR. Mm -hmm. You got five, six, seven, eight rooms tied off of a single rack system. Would you do a separate set of drawings for each room? Yeah, we 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 never did a system like that, so it never came up. If if we did, it would have been you know drawing flags, you know, C system and and the 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 drawings were named by systems so it would be you know let's say it would be that portion of the rack that was dedicated to that system would be shown in that drawing any interconnects or any other pieces of the rack that were dedicated to the other system would say c system xyz drawing number three and and that's how that's how we would have done it see and i think that's 
great when it comes to rooms that are separate, right? Yes. And if it's a 200 room project and 200 of the rooms are really close to the same or they're a standardized system, something along those lines, they don't connect to each other, they're standalone. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, in that case, you could almost do a standardized drawing that applies to all rooms and just copy and paste it into every single system folder that has it. But in the case where you've got a really complex AV system with a lot of shared equipment, because it's not even yeah. it's not even this portion of the rack applies to that system. No, that portion of the DSP, which right. Is right. not even physical anymore because it's all network based audio and video and it's virtual connections and separation within those devices. Like, how do you accomplish that from a, from a, I don't even know what we're referring to this as, right? As this, this separation of systems and, and organization by systems from a drawing perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's where that's where I think when we were doing it like that, I think we were trapped in the old mentality that saw computer folders as just a replacement for physical folders. Because you know, in especially in, in, in the world of clouds now, it doesn't matter where things are saved as long as you can get quick access to them. Right? And so I don't think it's important anymore to have a folder per system. I just think you need a quick way to access the most current information for a particular room. So that might not be saving project files in a particular folder. That might not matter. You know, it might just be having a database that can access that that information quickly. And, yeah, and so was, they can be stored in the cloud, they can be stored on the local server, it doesn't matter as long as my service technician can get to that information ASAP with someone on the line. I think that's all that matters. So it, it might not even be how to save system documentation, it's how to access it. Yeah, how to how to provide an interface for someone that needs to get access to the information. I was I was just kind of going down that chain of thinking in my head as you were describing it because and but I, I do think that that's the case even with project management software and databases. It's still often stored as project data that stays with the project all the way through. So whether it's a pretty interface like a SharePoint or it's literally folders on a server somewhere, the organization structure is still the same. And so trying to come back to imagining that experience as a as a service tech. You know, I'm I'm mm -hmm. customer and I call you and hey, I have a problem with with room six over in building two. You know, what is what is an interface that can be created or a database or an ERP system or a ticketing system that allows you to okay, what's what's the first piece of information that you have? It's customer, right? Yes. And then it's location, because how many of our customers have multiple locations? What what's your what's your address, right? So hierarchy, address, mm -hmm. what building are you in? Yeah. Some users might not even know that depending on who's calling into the help desk at the end of the day, you know, and that's that's interesting because giving clear identifiers inside of the rooms themselves that come back and correlate to how you have it labeled within your within your system, I think is also super, super important. But then being able to pull up, OK, room room six, room six. Right. Where is where's room six at? How can I underneath that customer? How can I get access to room six's data very, very quickly? Man, you know, with as many folders as we have, with as many projects as we have over the many years that we've been deploying systems, it sounds like such a uh, room six is now the Diablo room, Ryan says, right? It sounds like such a, an incredibly heavy undertaking 
to be able to get a structure in place, especially like Midway, right? How do you how do you how do you start establishing a framework to go forward with versus and, and do you go backwards also? And yeah, that's the question. But I know I know that the service teams spend almost ridiculous amounts of time seeking. I mean, that just brings you back to the whole point that you were making, right? How much time do you spend actually finding the information you need to be able to start actually solving the problem? And as, as customers get more adept at calling help desk for user issues, for any sort of issues, like what's the what's the you know what's the reasonable amount of time that a customer should expect to sit on the phone while you're looking up information for the system which is interesting because i almost feel like in an initiative like this that could be a metric of success like how fast mm. from the moment of okay go i'm going to time you how fast can you get to the drawing for this room or how fast can you get to can you get to the control system files or how fast can you get to the DSP program? And I guess at that point, it doesn't matter. Like if you're getting to this drawing, you should be getting to any file that has anything to do with that room. So it comes back to that question of how fast can you actually identify what room that customer is calling from and, and where the information is for that room? To me, that's the metric of success. Yeah. And the faster, the shorter amount of time that you can do that in, to me, equals customer experience. It is it is directly related to customer experience. Well, and and not only that, I mean, if we wanted to get crazy, right? Be because now we're dealing with databases and user permissions and whatnot. What if we put some of that information into a user portal, and so? It, it's one thing for for trained service technicians to get that information. What about having clients get that information on their own in terms of training videos or operation manuals or or system drawings? On a per How, system basis, not on, on a per, per project basis. Uh, project yeah. basis, right? This is a just yeah. a fundamentally completely different mindset for yeah how to store data, and it's not even how to store data. It's how to organize it and how to access it, like you said, but it's hard not to go deep into the weeds with like just drawings, for example. Drawings is such a perfect example of as a project, as a project manager, I want all my drawings in one nice bundle for that project. I want all 200 rooms in one binder. I don't want to have to have 200 different files to be able to accomplish that. And so then you know, can you have the same file but still access that file differently and separately? Can you can you bookmark, if you will, the pages within that file and make that accessible oh, through God. an interface so that you're no longer having to create separate documents? That would be awesome. That would be awesome. I mean, that would be incredible. But even just because I, I don't think it would be that big a lift, right? Because we need like we use that network schedule. And so on on the network schedule, the, the 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 starting page is what rooms are we touching? And so we have a list of all the rooms. We can plug that into a database pretty quickly. And then anytime there is a project, the links to the drawings are going to be the same for the entire project. So so updating that room database can be pretty quick as long as we're careful about how we name the rooms. Um, but to get so so putting a link in as to where the most recent drawings for that room is, I, I don't think that's a big lift. But if we could figure out how to access a bookmark within a PDF, I mean, that would be. That, that would, would be, be nice. Crazy. I mean, it's it's an efficiency. You know, you're making me think back to like this absolute horror story of a situation, which is numbering of rooms. So you get a you get a set of plans. Yes from the architect and they've got what, what we'll call them construction room numbers right that they've yeah. laid out how often is it 
that the construction room numbers are actually the numbers that go on the wall outside of the room on the beautiful placard that yep. facilities mounts on the outside of the room. Yep. So we had this project once for a university that was a whole building and included an auditorium, 10 plus different lecture halls, a bunch of different conferences, huge, huge, huge project. We had built every piece of documentation, drawings, network schedule, everything, build drawings, build documents 100% across the board built on those construction numbers. And then the client came back and said, hey, Jeremy, we're going to change all of the room numbers on the construction. They were going to change the construction document room numbers at the architect level. And so that's we all sat down deal, and right? said, okay, so here's what that's <laughs> going to mean for you at the end of the day. What that's going to mean is you're going to have a legend that means, you know, room one actually equals room two and room two actually equals room three and room three actually equals room four in this set of documentation. Oh, they man. ended up having us go back and, and paying the money to have us go back and redo every single one of our documents, drawings, network schedules. I mean, DSP files were written that had these room numbers in there. And I was so thankful that we came to the conclusion of like, no, 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 we are going to, we're going to go ahead and take the time and the money and yeah. effort to try to realign all these room numbers because in the end, the service team trying to come up. I mean, we were, we've talked about just an infinite level of, of challenge and frustration around identifying which room, which system you're talking about. But this all kind of flows. Like, again, you know, there's been some good comments on, on, the, on the chat here. We got yeah. Ryan Teal and we've got Mr. Alan Rook commenting. Rook. And I, I loved Alan's comment about 60 seconds or less, right? Because even 60 seconds feels like a long time. Yeah. If, you, if you got an active presentation going on, that's forever. Yeah, I'm in, you know, I'm in, I'm in the room. <laughs> I, it, it's go time, right? It's yes. back to that pressure that we talked about at the beginning of the show, which no matter what you're doing from an AV perspective, the pressure is on for the stuff to work as quickly as possible. But still, I think if you could get to all the information necessary in 60 seconds or less, that's pretty good. But, you know, Ryan brought up a good point too, though, which is how often is it that I need to get to the drawings inside of five minutes or inside of 60 seconds? There's lots of other steps that can be done that don't require a drawing. But, you know, where I go with that is like, okay, but now you're depending on your customer to describe the system to you. Yeah, and how 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 dope is it to just be like, Mrs. Customer, the third box down from the top of the rack, can you tell me what, if that blue light is on? I mean, now you're a pro, you know? Like you, if, if, if you come from that position of power in a service call, like now you just put the client completely at ease, right? Because now it's not, all right, tell me what's going on. What, what I don't even know what you have in your room. Explain to me, is there a display and there's a projector? It's like, who, who am I talking to? Why am I calling you? But if you come back with pictures of the room, knowing exactly what boxes are in there and just calmly walking them through from, from that position of knowledge, like it's a completely different experience. That's the holy grail, I think. Like, yeah. To be able to empower someone on the receiving end of a customer help call mm -hmm. with getting getting their brain into that system, into that moment as quickly as possible. Um, Ryan, <laughs> Ryan put in a really interesting point. Like we have no audio right now in the Diablo room. Yeah, so that's not even a room number. Right. That that's even right. another layer here, which is <laughs> you have the construction room number and then you have the building number that facilities decided to name or or number everything as if you're lucky enough to get the number outside of the room. And then you've got the cultural name, which so many people come to know these spaces and rooms by. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I can we agree that this is not an easy task? No, definitely not easy. But I, what, what is interesting, it's not an easy task, but I think I'm happy 
that we're walking away with at least a goal, right? Like an, an, and a problem well defined is a problem half solved. And if we know what we're looking for, 60 seconds or less to hit any information about a system, that is that is a worthy goal. And the, the rest maybe is just details and JavaScript. JavaScript, huh? You think that's the that's the language of choice here? Did I sound a, like a programmer? I, I'm going to leave that one alone. I, I mean, it sounded yeah. good. It sounded good. I had to shine some light on it, though. You know, right. I know. I, it, 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 listen, I'm, I'm trying to put. Uh, yeah, I got nothing. I don't know. <laughs> you know, Ryan made a really good point here. You know, he 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 kind of typed out in the comments. Sure, I'd be happy to help. Can you please give me a little more detail, please? Right, and that's that's it, right? How can you keep the customer moving forward? How can you keep the customer engaged while you're pulling things up, right? That's that's my mindset. Is yes. Oh, I need to be getting documentation in front of me as quickly as possible, so at least I have an understanding of what I'm up against from a system perspective. Mm -hmm. And I like I like what Ryan's indicated. Like there's, there's there's a whole process here. There's a whole paradigm shift in terms of okay, customers on the phone, timers going. You need to be able to get to that in, information in a short time. That doesn't mean you actually need the information, but that should be the mindset, right? I should be able to get to the information very quickly. I know we're 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 approaching the end of time here. We're I think about four minutes away from our hour. Um, but back to the days of AVR. Did you track it by construction room number or cultural room name? Cultural room name. Cultural room name. And we had we had empty files um, that just had a Word document. So it would be like uh, client A, room three, and there would just be a Word document that say, uh, you know, all system documentation is actually found in the Diablo room because that's what the client decided to change the room name to on this date. And so then you could go back and find the Diablo room. So and that I did. So Alan talked about that. He actually made a comment. How do you track iterations on a on a room that don't apply to the original total project? That iteration could simply be, hey, room 301 is now Tesla yep. or the Diablo room, right? Yeah. Or any other number of cultural names. And then what happens if that company gets a new CEO or a new leadership and they want to change the names of all the rooms? Yeah. You kind of need to have the ability to iterate on that that entity, if you will, right? Yeah. The entity yeah. the, the space, the entity is the entity until it changes, right? Until it until it morphs into something else and and finding a way to track on that throughout its entire life until it is no longer a room that has technology if ever it is holy cow so yeah. has somebody written some software i know like service now there's like some incredible ticketing software out there that you can build in room databases and and knowledge bases and tie it all together but it still seems to me to be just a complete operational mindset shift of the people that are doing the projects versus the people that are supporting the projects and needing to access that information once the project is done. Yeah, but that and and that's I mean that's just good database etiquette, right? Like it would and 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 that's why I kind of like the idea of just keeping everything on links because it doesn't matter where it's stored, it doesn't matter how it's filed, as long as we have a record. If the room was Bank A, Diablo, Bank A, 17, and Bank A, 243. If those are all the same rooms, as long as all the links go to the, the correct information, it works, right? A client could call up and be looking at, it could, it could be like the, uh, the facilities manager working off the architectural drawings. And room one, I know where the drawings are. It could be a client calling about the Diablo room same drawings, but they're calling about the Diablo room because that's how they called it. As long as the links all go to the same spot, I think that's successful. And and then to keep track of all those iterations, it is the nightmare, but at least you're not changing files. You're not doing crazy stuff. You're just adding uh, an entry in the database 
and and updating that information. You know, you kind of gave me an aha moment, honestly, because for me and my brain for a long time, I've thought that this 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 translation, if you will, or this exchange needed to happen at the end of the project mm. when it goes from project into support. But I think you nailed it with the fact that it needs to happen the minute that the project is signed. Like yeah. it needs it needs to go through the deployment process and it on a per system basis, which is again a complete turn of mindset when it comes to managing things as a project versus managing things as systems within a project. Yeah. We we had a call, we had a service call and actually I, I think Ryan left, but Ryan took a call today that a client called up saying the touch panel in a room doesn't work. And the reason the touch panel didn't work was because the room was being upgraded <laughs> and the users didn't know. I, uh, yeah, I think I, I think I might've been on that. I, I might've been on that one today. Yeah, yeah that, that was a perfect That's example. Crazy. When I know that particular client is that they're trying to solve the same issue, yeah. which is how do you have a single source of truth? Yes. When it comes to your rooms and the systems and the things that have gone on inside of it. And at the end of the day, we know it's a database. We know it's linking to information, but it's a mindset and it's a it's a it's a commitment to continual maintenance, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it's a strategy that I don't think a lot of integrators have adopted yet. But but they should if if they want to have that, you know, user and and operator at, at the heart of how they access information. You know, it's not just based on project. It's got to be the folks who live with the system day in and day out. They they have to be our focus. And it comes back to the old mantra build with service in mind, right? Everything with Absolutely. service in mind. They're, they're the folks that live with the system the longest. And man, for so long, I've been teaching that in the context of how we install things and how we fabricate things and the physical layer, if you will, of mm -hmm. that of that paradigm. And it's not enough. It's clearly not enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jim, we've made it to our hour, my friend. Yeah, dude, that, that, that was another good one. I like that. I got a lot of things to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, again, I think my my closing thoughts on this are it's a problem worth solving Definitely. because I think it's directly related to customer experience at the end of the day, reduce of of overhead, redu reduction of friction reduction of frustration efficiency i mean the the gains if being able to solve even 50 to 75 percent of what we're talking about are massive if anybody's out there listening that has has the solution has solved this knows how to do it knows how to how to make it easy I'd love to hear from you love to hear from anybody on on their experience with trying to solve this exact issue. Yeah. You have yeah, and I, I'm just always blown away at how, I guess, uh, I don't know if inertia or, or just how much um, past thought or past ways of thinking affects my thinking now. Because, you know, I, I, I said before, I, I used to store information per system in system folders, but that was based on my relationship with physical folders, right? We used to print out drawings and put them in physical folders, and, and that's what was in my brain. I don't need to do that anymore with, with links and, and databases. It's the same thing with designing with, with service in mind. You know, we think of physical, we think of space, we think of of allowing a physical tech to be there. And that's 
it's great. It, it's half the battle, but we really need to be thinking of that virtual aspect and remote connecting into systems and just having access to information as quickly as possible. And it's just, I got to, I got to shed off the old way of thinking and keep in mind that we're, we're in a digital world now. It's, uh, I don't know if it's showing my age or or or, or I, what. I was ab I was about to call you out on that and be like, "Damn, you're old," but I'm pretty sure we're pretty much the same age. So that mm -hmm. that would be kind of self-deprecating on my part. <laughs> yeah. um, isn't there a term for that? What what's the name for the the scenario when you come up against the problem and you use the, the digital native? Is that it or? or... No, no, there's an effect. I think we teach it in AV 9000. It's like you come across a problem and you feel like you have it solved because of your previous experience. But in, in reality, is it like Einstein effect? Is that what it is? Yeah, dude. Isn't that like a perfect you example of that? that out of, yes, that is exactly I, it. Just for the record, I did not oh. look at anything on my computer. That was that was. I thought I was going to get it wrong. I thought it was going to be like an audio concept or something, but no, I think it's the Einstein effect. When we come across a problem that we've come across before, yes. we think we already know how to solve it because of previous experience. This is such a perfect example of Dude. needing to completely unwire. I can't believe you pulled that out. I'm so impressed. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, I think everybody, we're going to leave you with the Einstein effect. Yes. Look it up. Don't get don't get caught by it because <laughs> it'll prevent you from uh, moving to databases and links and you'll still be printing stuff out and putting them in file folders. See? Exactly. Jim, absolute pleasure as always, man. Thanks for the time and uh, see you again next month. Absolutely, man. All right. Thanks, everybody who tuned in and we'll catch up with you in a month. Yeah. Have a good night.